Well, let's get right to work. Uh, let's get right to work. We will be cutting this video out as well so people can because we're talking about matchups that are happening Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Uh, the two teams, you know, the the Vegas and the Kings who played last night, they don't have to start till Monday, which is nice for uh, them. Also, I will have all of the odds up here for series and for Stanley Cup and for conference. Uh, let's start with the – we're going to go in order chronologically as the games bang out. We start the NHL playoffs at 5 p.m. Eastern – on 420, April 20th, your NHL playoff pool rosters must be in by 5 p.m. Eastern on Saturday, April 20th. We have the New York Islanders, 39, 27, and 16, 18, 17, and 6 on the road at the Carolina Hurricanes, 52, 23, and 7, 27, 10, and 4 at home at PNC Arena in Raleigh, North Carolina. Sorokin is expected to be the starting goaltender, but Semyon Varlamov was the best goaltender down the stretch. That's nice to have in your pocket. It's nice to have in your pocket, just in case. You can bring out Varlama. Varlama, we've seen backup goaltenders get hot. That could easily happen here. But Sorokin is expected to start. And then we have Freddie Anderson. Uh, is Freddie Anderson a 1.84 goals against average, 932 save percentage with three shutouts in 15 games, getting shut out every five games? No. Does he buckle under the pressure? Yes. Will that happen here? I mean, that's what we're trying to figure out. They've got Kochekov backing him up. So they're in pretty good shape. This has been a goaltending crew that's been an absolute mess, and they're actually in pretty good shape. Hurricanes right now to win the Stanley Cup are the favorite at Bet365. Six and a half to one, plus 650. The New York Islanders, you have to click a show more to see them at 50 to one. To win the conference and series action, let's get into that. To win the conference, sorry, I'll have this all set up better for the following games hurricanes are plus 275 and the islanders are 25 to 1 to win the series the islanders are plus 325 and the hurricanes are minus 425 so obviously a bet 365 with just a ridiculous amount of vig we have to know that in future betting and round betting that they're going to take uh, an alarming amount of money uh, in juice steve g says islanders might get swept uh, and yes, did I, if I said that wrong, did I say that wrong? That hurricanes are the favorite. And my dude says, I love the Dallas stars to win it. So we're going to talk all about that. The Islanders come into the playoffs rolling. They close the season winning eight of nine. They're only set back being a three, two shootout loss at the Rangers. So they got points in all nine of their games. You know, we all moved on. No, I shouldn't say we all, but a bunch of us moved on the Islanders at plus plus one ninety to make the playoffs when Patrick Waugh was announced as coach. And this isn't just Patrick Waugh doing a hell of a job. It's Lou Lamorello doing a hell of a job, you know? When uh, you see Dubis with the Leafs after Lamorello, you have a little boy manager. You see what little fanboys do. They bring in Joe Thornton and Wayne Simmons because, look, I'm the same age as Dubis. They, we, we love Wayne Simmons. Everybody in Toronto loves Wayne Simmons. We all love Joe Thornton. That's how he met. He brings in Carlson, the Norris Trophy winner, that to help an already good power play, and it becomes the worst power play, sort of, you know, marginally. Where's that? But, but we don't need to get in that. Then Trailoving gets a job. Why? Because it's this old man network that you, if you're an old white guy who's being a manager for 15, 20 years, you, you will always get another job. He's made terrible, terrible decisions, and, and the Flames are god-awful because of Trailoving's decisions. Now he's the manager of the Leafs. And I digress. Lou Lamorello has done a spectacular job. He knew to fight with these top teams in the Eastern Conference, he needs to have the best goaltending in the league. So he spent a lot of money on it. Then he knew he needs to have the toughest and best stay-at-home defenseman in the league, Pelican Pullock. So he brought them in. Now, if you're going to have stay-at-home defenseman, you need to have a sniper on the power play on defense, a power play quarterback. So we got Noah Dobson, drafted him in the first round. Now, Dobson is dealing with an upper body injury. He's missed three straight games. I, we'll hear what Bobano thinks. I expect him to be in the lineup. The Hurricanes are also playing their best hockey. Uh, their five-game winning streak was snapped in a 6-3 loss at Columbus when they sat multiple players. Jesper Faust was the only player injured. He came back, and then he got helped off the ice and hurt again. We have not got the official update on whether Jesper Fast will be in or out of the lineup. Chase J says, I'm a local Hurricanes fan. This price is too rich. Islanders playing with revenge of last year's playoff elimination. Hurricanes are better, but no value in this, even in a parlay piece, in his opinion. And, and I get that. I don't, you know, this is a dangerous team. These Islanders are a very dangerous team to fade. They're dangerous. The thing is, is we've watched Bobano's draws, uh, and we have that up on the screen. Uh, and that's 
he's lost seven of his last eight. These draws were looking very, very strong. They're still, they're still gave a plus money. This is the time. And I, I imagine Bobano and I hope Bobano touches on this. This is the time where the draws will offer a lot of value. There's going to be a lot of draws in this one. Let's go into the line history for game one here. Game one, Saturday at 5 p.m. Then we'll hand it over to Bobana. We're going to use pinnacle lines. Right now, Carolina is minus 222. They opened up at minus 210. We've had 12 cents of movement towards them. From a total side of things here, we're dealing with a five and a half. Under five and a half at minus 116. Uh, that sounds like a fair price. Are we looking at the first period under and the full game under? I certainly am. I've not moved on anything yet. Take it away, Bobano. New York Islanders, Carolina Hurricanes, our first round matchup and our first breakdown. Take it away. It's it's interesting because they're playing a Red Hot Islanders team that played their best hockey down the stretch and a Carolina team that, um, you know, awesome, really, uh, in the last few weeks of the season. And Freddie Anderson actually played very well. And I'm not a big Freddie Anderson fan. It was playoff track record hasn't been great, but he was really good down the stretch for Carolina played very well. And of course they've got a guy in Piotr Kochekov that I think very highly of as far as, you know, his ability to play uh, in net for the hurricanes. So the, the both goalies I'm fine with, I'm even fine with Anderson because I'm going to buy into him playing well down the stretch. He's got to do it in the playoffs. Now the Islanders, a big part of their turnaround is they got a lot better on the power play. Their five on five offense started to get going. Uh, and, you know, defensively, for, especially with their goaltending, they turned away from Ilya Sorokin, and they turned to someone that Patrick Waugh, the new head coach, took over midseason, is very familiar with, Semyon Varlama from his Colorado days, and he played absolutely terrific uh, down the stretch for the Islanders. So, you know, it's just a surging hot Islanders team. We've seen this before with Florida last year, with many examples before that of teams that are red hot going into the playoffs become very dangerous in the first round. But at the end of the day, you have a Carolina team that got all the way to the Eastern Conference final, ended up getting swept by Florida, but every game was a one goal game and a Florida team that was red hot and got to the Stanley Cup final. And I can't help but think Carolina's roster right now is better than it was last year when they got swept in the Eastern Conference Finals. I think they're a better team. And if I think they're a better team right now, I can't go against them, and I won't in this series, despite how red hot the Islanders are. So, you know, I do think the Islanders push Carolina, but I think that's as far as it goes. The thing that bothers me for the Islanders, how much did they rely down the stretch on Bo Horvat, Brock Nelson, and Kyle Palmieri offensively? Way too much, in my opinion. You just did not get enough from the supporting cast. And what if this great Carolina defensive squad, which we know they're capable of having, led by Brenda Moore coaching them, shuts down those big guns for the Islanders that have carried them offensively down the stretch? Where's the rest of the offense going to come? I also am concerned about how much better the Carolina power play is with Jake Gensel. And Jake Gensel just makes Carolina's team all around very be much better, offensively especially. Their power play was awesome down the stretch, Carolina. And the Islanders... All these years with Barry Trotz and this defensive-minded team, low scoring, they don't score goals, but they're great defensively. they got a great penalty kill. They don't have a great penalty kill this year. It's been awful. It's been one of the worst penalty kills in the NHL, and I think that is an area that Carolina can exploit in this series. So I like Carolina to advance uh, in this series. No series bet, obviously, at this price. And I'm going to throw a curveball at everyone because all I hear in terms of totals in this series is everyone loving the unders. Everyone loving the unders. The Islanders have not been a dead nuts under team this year. Okay, they've scored more. Their power play has been better. Their penalty kill stinks compared to what it's been in years past. Varlamov in net for as good as he was down the stretch. He has not had a great playoff track record, the few playoff starts he's had. And on the flip side, you know, I think Carolina's a better offensive team, maybe even a much better offensive team and deeper offensive team since getting Jake Gensel. Don't be surprised if this is a sneaky over series and you're going to get fives. And you're going to get five and a halfs to take plus money with overs in this series. I'm going to be looking at that value side of it from a totals perspective. More goals than people think. That's in interesting. That's interesting because I think that the Islanders fear the Hurricanes offense. And they're the ones that are going to go into the shell. They're the ones that are going to line up five on the line and play devil's early 90s trap hockey. Not her Carolina. I think Carolina is going to attack, and I think that 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 Lamorello, he built 
those New Jersey Devils trap teams. So what's your take on that? And then we'll move on to the next game. Because I think Islanders are going to play. I, I'm, I'm going to bet the first period under one and a half and the full game under five and a half. And I imagine the final score being 2-0 or 3-1 Carolina. And then we'll see fives. And then, and then move on overs. But take it away. What are your thoughts? I do not think Carolina plays trappy. I think the Islanders do. Touch on that before we move on to the next matchup. Yeah, I mean, I'll be even... I'll, first time I see a five, I'll be on the over uh, in this series. There's no question about that. Um, uh, can the Islanders play 2-1 games like they used to? I don't know. To me, they have not looked like a team that can consistently shut it down like that, at least from what I've seen. I don't think they're quite as good you know, defensively as we've seen in the past. And that's even with Pelican and Pollock coming back. You know, and, and there's been games where, yes, they've 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 won two nothing. They've won three one. They've given up 40 shots and, and they've needed the goaltender to be absolutely spectacular. I keep thinking of that Nashville game, you know, and that was just the goaltender. You know, they didn't play great defensively. They were giving up great A's all over the ice. I remember watching that game because I took Nashville or did, what was did I take? I think I did. Yeah, I took Nashville that night. And Nashville only lost because the goaltender was spectacular. They were giving up great chances. They hit a couple posts. I don't think they're as good defensively, and their penalty kill is way down from where it's been uh, in the past. So, like I said, I think there's this, there's going to be maybe a few more overs in this series than people think. The question is, game one, we'll see. It is an afternoon game, weird start time. Maybe that one stays under, but uh, I think as the series goes on, it's not going to be every game under in this series, in my opinion. Very important stuff. Very important stuff. So for game one, for your official record, is there anything you're moving on or do we move on? Yeah, we move on. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to 8 p.m. Eastern on Saturday night, 420. Hockey night in Canada. Toronto Maple Leafs go into the House of Horrors, TD Garden in Boston, Massachusetts. The Leafs 46, 26, and 10, 24, 11, and 6 on the road. Boston Bruins 47, 20, and 15, 24, 11, and 6 at home. Both teams closed out the season in underwhelming fashion. Right now, the Bruins are minus 125 to win the series. The Leafs are plus 105. I think it's a real interesting debate about whether or not this Toronto Maple Leafs team is better suited for the playoffs this year than they were last year. The problem with the debate is that Ryan O'Reilly, Ryan O'Reilly was a perfect playoff player. He's perfect. And they had him on the roster last year. And he helped enormously. This year's team with Bertuzzi and Domi and, you know, Reeves being tough. I know you don't want him on the ice often, but you want him to kick somebody's ass with McKay blocking shots with his face. There is a feeling like this team is much tougher and more equipped. The issue here is everybody thinks Toronto is going to fail. Everybody expects them to lose and everybody expects them to play heartless in Toronto. I, I talk to parents and they're like laughing. They're like, how much money should I put on the Bruins laughing? And I tell them, I'm like, where's Bergeron and Krejci? Like, do you really fear this Bruins team? Like we used to fear them. Because I don't, in saying that, I'm still pessimistic. I'm still nervous to back the Leafs. Uh, will Nylander back check in the playoffs? Uh, he's a spectacular offensive forward, but you know, bad penalties and doesn't back check enough. Uh, I would take him 100 times out of 100 over Pedersen. You know, don't get me wrong. So... The Leafs finished the season with their four straight loss, six-four setback at the Lightning on Wednesday. Yarncroc, Domi, and McMahon are banged up. We know Keith loves Yarncroc. One of the things that Keith can do with the Leafs that you can't do really well with the Bruins is he can change up the lines nonstop. He can give you so many different looks, and he's done a pretty good job at that. I've stopped disliking Keith. I've kind of liked some of the, what he's doing this year, keeping teams off balance. Bruins finished their season with their third loss in four games, 3-1 at home versus Senators. Brazo has been out with an upper body injury. He's their heavyweight. They need Justin Brazo healthy. I don't think he I don't think he can fight. It's an upper body injury. Forbore and Carlo are banged up. So the Leafs are 13 to 1 to win the cup. Remember, they opened the year as the favorite to win the cup, which made no sense. A plus 750. To win the conference, they're six and a half to one. Uh, Bruins are 11 to 1 to win the cup. To win the conference, they're plus 550. Swiggy says Pasternak was Bruins' best player this year. Pasternak was I mean if it wasn't for you know McKinnon, Kucherov, and McDavid, you know Pasternak would be the best player in the league this year. He was phenomenal. 
He was absolutely spectacular. He's a top five player in the NHL. Uh, we we know what they have with Coyle and Marshawn, and we, we know that they have grit. And but do they have enough? And and Charlie McAvoy, take it away for us here, Bobano, Maple Leafs Bruins. I mean, if you're betting history and you're betting pedigree and all that, you you have to be on Boston here because you look at the Bruins beating the Leafs in three series. Although I want to point out with people saying the Bruins always beat the Leafs in the playoffs. You know, all three playoff series victories for the Bruins were seven game series. You know, it's not like they completely blew the Leafs right out of the building. You know, that those were hard fought, tough series, uh, including, of course, the one, the first one where they had that four to one lead in the third period and they ended up losing in overtime, the Bergeron goal. Um, So the Leafs competed. They were right there with Boston in all three of those series. Now, this year in the regular season, that's another, you know, thing that your people are going to throw out there that like Boston, that Boston swept the regular season series this year uh, against Toronto as well. So that's a bunch of history that's against them. And it's as much of a physical ability to execute and play at a high level on the ice as much as as it will be mentally for the Leafs, mentally to get over this block and this hurdle that it seems like the uh, Bruins uh, have. Uh, on them Uh, like to me I was really really interested to you know maybe take a go against Boston and I still kind of lean Toronto here in this series quite honestly because I don't really love what I saw to the Bruins down the stretch I am concerned in various facets of their game uh, late in the season Uh, a bit of a malaise develop Uh, I you know you look at Brandon Carlo's health going into this series they lost him in the last few games that defense didn't look the same now they do expect him to be back which sounds uh, promising here for the Bruins. But, you know, I just think with Boston, there's a little bit of a vulnerability. And let's not act like, you know, Toronto's been the only team that shit the bed. Toronto's the only team that's had heartbreak and gagged away series and choked away losses. No bigger choke and gag than the Bruins last year uh, against the Florida Panthers in the first round. So uh, this is one where, look, I, I don't know if I have the guts to take Toronto. But I am leaning that way. The biggest concern is can Ilya Samsonov play like he did for the majority of the second half of the season um, for the Toronto Maple Leafs? If he does, if he plays well, Ilya Samsonov, the Leafs are going to win this series, in my opinion, because I think they got more game breakers up front. I know it's concerning that we've not seen anything from Matthews and Marner in the playoffs. They have to be the the, the big guns and, and the star players that the Leafs expect them to be. And I'm not talking about the 69 goal regular season version of Austin Matthews or the, you know, 80, 90 point version of Mitch Marner in the, in the regular season. I'm talking about the playoff production, which has not been there for those two guys the last few years. It simply has to be there for them if they're going to win this series. But uh, like I said, I think the Bruins are vulnerable. Uh, and I think the Leafs have a chance. Again, it's it, for me, this is a, two teams I have a very difficult time trusting, so this is not a strong opinion, but for the purposes of our playoff pool, which I'll be signing up for later this afternoon, and you should be as well, uh, our Pub Sports Radio playoff pool, I'm going to pick Toronto to advance here. Yeah, I can understand why you're doing it. Uh, are you going to take Toronto in game one? And here's another thing, too, and here's a good bet, too. Here's actually one. I'm going to make this official. This is so. This is a this is a series series player prop wager that I have placed, uh, and I think it's I think it's tremendous value uh, as far as leading goal scorer in this series. That's a great market that's available at all the major books: FanDuel, DraftKings, Bet three six five. This I am going to make official because I think it's got a realistic shot to cash. Let's go for most goals in the series at twenty five to one. The former Boston Bruin, now with the Toronto Maple Leafs, Tyler Bertuzzi. He has been brought in here to be the difference maker for this team, to score the kind of goals that this team just far too long has not been able to score, those dirty area goals, those goals right in front of the goal crease and the blue paint, getting to the front of the net, getting to the traffic areas where you need to go if you're going to have offensive success in the playoffs. And then it doesn't hurt that he's playing against his former team there's obviously going to be that incentive to even go up to that, that another level. And the fact that he was red hot in the second half of the season, Tyler Bertuzzi found his game. He was scoring left and right. He finally found some confidence playing with Domi and Matthews uh, on the top line. I think that is a tremendous, very live plus 2,500 for him to lead this series in goals. Do you like the Maple Leafs roster this year better than last year? Playoff roster. 
I I do the one part I agree with is that I wish they still had O'Reilly. I think their blue line has more depth, more diversity. They got guys that can carry the puck, and they've got way more sandpaper, way more. We're going to put you through the boards, you know, type of defenseman with Labushkin and another year of Jake McCabe, and obviously the way Simone Benoit has played for them uh, this year. I like that you know Bertuzzi and Domi with the offensive upside. They're not willing to be pushed around either. There, there's going to be pushback now from this Toronto team from a physicality standpoint. And that was a big reason why Florida beat them last year. Florida beat them up in the physicality department. And there was just not enough of that physical pushback from Toronto. This year, I think they've got a team more equipped for that. You could argue that maybe from a little bit of a finesse and skill standpoint, the roster they had last year might have been a little bit better. But I think for the hard rough and tumble, you know, and what did we see from Vegas last year? What have we seen from recent cup champions? Big defensemen that are willing to throw their weight around. That can skate, though. You got to be able to skate in today's NHL. They can skate. They can throw their weight around. They got physicality. I think Toronto's got that on the back end. I'd still take Boston's blue line over Toronto's because just depth and players that have performed at a high level, no doubt. And I love McAvoy uh, and his game. Uh, But this Toronto blue line's got that physicality. And even up front. They won't be pushed around like they were last year by the Florida Panthers. And that's a big reason why I think uh, it's not I, – I'm going to t- say this year's team slightly better. Well, I tell you this. Um, and, you know, I first off, I should give you guys the line history. This opened up with the Leafs at plus 114 and now plus 111. At I do want to say about O'Reilly, though. O'Reilly's offensive production was disappointing last year in the playoffs. It was. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It it was, but when when he's not like a, you know, he's not like a Sedin. I mean, Sedin's not the right because they could cycle when they weren't scoring. But when when these guys aren't scoring, like players like O'Reilly, they do a lot of other things on the ice that can help you win a hockey game. But I hear that. I I know what I'm going to do here. I tell you where I worry about Toronto is in Toronto. You know, the pressure is immense. I am going to bet. They play better on the road. They do. Yeah. I'm going to bet the Maple Leafs in game one of this series. If I'm right, I'm not going to take them again in game two. And I'm probably not going to take them again in game three. I'm going to take the Leafs to win game one of this series. I I do not think the, the what, what concern. I kind of wish I was fading a Bruins team running better. Honestly, I feel like the, I don't want to. I don't care that they lost three one that much in, in against the centers. I just don't. I just think that. You take the great first ballot Hall of Famer Patrice Berger on off this team. You take David Krejci, your your dream second line sentiment off this team. I just look. I love Charlie Coyle, and I, I love what Zach is doing. I, I just I think that in Game One of this series, the Leafs are going to have no pressure on them. That pressure will mount, and they haven't been able to handle it well. Uh, then Brahman, no, uh, I I'm not going to take them to win Game Two. I don't think. I don't think. I'm just going to take him game one. Slatsy says Bruins are 7-0 and last seven games versus Leafs. And, yeah, I'll deal with those consequences. Uh, you know, so I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be on the Leafs. Oh, and also, uh, my unit size going back to 300. We moved it up to 400 because I was the hottest I've been in a long time, and there was motivational advantages. I put it up. I'm going back to 300. That was what I... We moved it to on January 1st. So we're going back. Uh, this is a playoffs, a different animal. I'm going back $300 unit size. I'm going to be on the Leafs in game one. Okay. We move on to Sunday, April 21st action. The Tampa Bay Lightning, 45, 29, and 8, 2018 and 3 on the road. The Florida Panthers, 52, 24, and 6, 26, 13, and 2 at home or the American, American. Excuse me, Amarant Bank Arena in Sunrise, Florida. This game's going off at 12:30 p.m. Eastern. The Florida fans are very upset about the time, and and I get it. For a game of this magnitude, you don't want to uh, you don't want to change everybody's TV rules. The world you want to have a quadruple header. Someone had to get this spot. That's why it is like this. Yeah, it's um, it's a it's it it makes the cap trickier. Would you agree with that? The game one cap trickier because it's at 12 30 p.m and everybody's out of their routine do you agree with that Boban? Yeah, a little bit i would i would say so yeah all right let's get into this one here these are two very good hockey teams. it's the worst case scenario for me boston losing that game because 
uh, these are the only two teams I've got futures on. Uh, it sucks. It sucks that they're going up against each other. Uh, my the few, my few, I can't lose money unless I add to it. Like everything's paid for because we've got a great uh, futures uh, and thanks to the Islanders and making the playoffs, Flyers not making the playoffs. But I don't like my situation. I've only got two teams in the East and two teams in the West, and they're b- all playing each other. I, and, and look, I'm not nearly as co- I'm not confident anymore on the Kings or anything like that. That was early in the season. But I have Kings, Oilers in the West, Lightning, Florida in the East, and they're both playing. It sucks. Lightning were stuck in this first wild card round for most of last week, you know, and so it allowed them to rest, bang the bodies, allowed them not to go all out, allowed them to, to play, not play their forwards too much. You know, Coochie went for the 100 assists to join McDavid, to join Bobby Orlemieux and Gretzky. It was great to see that all come to fruition. Uh, they look like a healthy group coming into the playoffs. Just Tyler Mott banged up. They have playoff-type performers. Tyler Mott, uh, Tanner Janot, who will fight the toughest guy in the league. They bring in Duclair, who immediately his uh, toughness. I mean, when I watch Duclair, Duclair play, I think he's 6'3". You know, he's much smaller than that because he plays a big, tough game. We know what Stamkos can do when he's locked in. We've been watching it for the last month. We know what Kucherov can do. We know what Hedman does. We, we This is a, a really, really good hockey team going up against a really, really good hockey team. Panthers finished the season strong. They looked vulnerable for a few weeks. Paul Maurice got them right. They closed their season with their four straight win, 5 2 home release on Tuesday. They expect to be fully healthy. Now, Aaron Eckblad hasn't played in a couple weeks. He probably won't be that good. You don't want to play him. I, you probably want to stick to 17, 18 minutes a game with, with Eckblad when he comes back. And Oliver Eckman Larson has been better than I expected. The series price for the Lightning plus 165 is doesn't, it, it shouldn't be that high. Uh, you know, it, it, uh, there, this is a, there's more parity between these two teams and it's baked into the odds. The Lightning would win the Cup 20 to 1, Conference 10 to 1. Panthers to win the cup 701, a conference three plus 325. This is a very difficult series uh, to very, very good hockey teams. Let's get into the line history here for this one for game one line history. This is Sunday morning. We have the Panthers at minus 165. Uh, they opened up at minus 157, eight cents of movement towards them. And from a total side of things, this is sitting at five and a half. Minus 117 to the over. This opened up at six. So the the Bruins, uh, it's a similar situation that we're seeing in that that Bruins Leafs total. Six moves to five and a half right away, but it's a very highly, heavily juiced to the over. It depends where you, where do you want the juice? Same thing happened here. It opened up at six and moved to five and a half. It's minus 117 to the over. Take it away for us, uh, Bobano and the Russian goaltenders. I always think that when Russian goaltenders face each other that they step up and Bobrovsky and Vasilevsky are you know played against each other a lot I expect them to both play well and I expect Vasilevsky to play very well even though he had rebound control issues all season they never stopped I mean his numbers got a little bit better but his rebound control was a problem all year long and I can't understand why that is take it away Bobano Lightning Panthers I mean this is the series I'm most looking forward to I mean this is this is incredible Battle of Florida they don't like each other uh, it's got all kinds of storylines galore. The Tampa Bay Lightning have one more big, long playoff run in them after getting to the Stanley Cup final three years in a row, winning two times, and then, of course, getting bounced last year in the first round by Toronto. Does now that give them that? Do they now have the batteries recharged? You know, because I think they needed that extra time off. We'll see if it helps them here uh, down the stretch. Meanwhile, you've got the Florida Panthers who have proven, at least this year in the regular season, that the run through to the Stanley Cup final last year was no fluke. This is a very good hockey team, uh, and they have proven that this season. It's got all kinds of great storylines. It's Florida trying to avenge an unceremonious sweep at the hands of Tampa Bay two years ago. Remember, the Lightning swept them uh, in the second round a couple of years ago, the year that uh, the third year Tampa got to the Stanley Cup final in a row when they lost to Colorado. So I, I think when you look at it, it's got all kinds of storylines, bad blood galore. I think when you look at Tampa Bay, though, the thing that concerns me the most is this hasn't been vintage Vasilevsky. He was better down the stretch, but from start to finish this year, this has not been a great year. What's his goals against? It's hovering just below three, and his save percentage is hovering around 900. Those are not Andre Vasilevsky numbers. And what bothers me about Tampa Bay is that they are very reliant on the power play, and they have a lethal power play. They have a tremendous power play, but it's almost like they rely on it too much. Their five-on-five play has been mediocre at best and i'm being kind by that because their five on five play really hasn't been great this year 
But again, you're talking about a Florida team that plays a style of hockey that sometimes lends itself to taking a lot of penalties. And that unfortunately, because the scrums after the whistle, face wash on the opposing player from Kachuk after the whistle, he does that shit all the time. You know, that's the kind of stuff that referees are going to nip in the bud early in this series and say, you know what, if there's that extra push and shove, there's that extra hack, you know, with the stick in the leg, or there's that extra cross check in the back after the whistle, they're going to call those the, the one team and put one of the teams on the power play to negate that because they know there's going to be a chippy affair. They know there's going to be a physical series. They know about the bad blood. So Florida's got to be careful here because their they're one-way ticket to losing this series is their discipline going off the rails and giving Tampa Bay a bunch of power plays, which is what they don't want because the Tampa Bay power play is elite. Their five-on-five five play isn't, but their power play is. So that's going to be very important here for Florida in this game. If they can at least not go over the edge with the discipline, uh, I think it's their series to lose. I do like Florida in this series to get the job done uh, over the uh, Tampa Bay Lightning. Again, no bet on the series price because even though I like a team, you will not see me ever lay minus 190 uh, with a series price. But I do think Florida will advance. This is actually going to be my first, well, I shouldn't say a first official play because I have the Bertuzzi. Uh, leading goal prop for Toronto Boston, but this is my first individual game official play for the show. I like over five and a half here uh, in this game. Uh, we're going to go over five and a half with the uh, Panthers and the Lightning uh, on Sunday. Uh, best current available price with that, as I check right now, uh, is minus. Uh, let me just see here, minus one one eighteen at Pinnacle. All right, so minus one eighteen at Pinnacle. Look, two straight overs head-to-head. -head. Lots of goals. Tampa Bay has been kind of an over machine down the stretch. I like what I'm seeing from their offense. I like what I see Kucherov, obviously, under an assist. Stamkos heating up at the right time. We know what Braden Point can do. Uh, and we're seeing Nick Paul, by the way. Nick Paul is going to be someone to cash in on from a prop standpoint in this series. Oh. Such an underrated player. Uh, look how he heated up down the stretch. Their offense is fine. I worry about that back end still. Sergachev out of there, and after Hedman, let's be honest. Let's be totally honest about the blue line for the Lightning. It doesn't match the Panthers, and there's big question marks more than ever before about your Radishes and your Nick Purbix and all these guys that are in that blue line now. I'm not convinced they're close to the same depth on the blue line, and not to mention Vasilevsky hasn't been as good this year. And one last thing, with the third and the fourth line, not as deep with the third, the third line with Coleman, Gord, and Goodrow years ago. Amazing third line. They don't have that quite as much anymore. Very top-heavy now, Tampa Bay. So that's going to be something that does concern me here. I think Florida got deeper up front, deeper on the blue line. Uh, Bobrovsky can match. Vasilevsky, especially if Vasilevsky plays the way he did much of the year, because we saw what Bobrovsky did in the playoffs last year. But again, in a series, it's going to be chippy. There's going to be penalties. And again, if Florida does take penalties, that's the one way Tampa Bay is really going to get their offense going with that incredible number one rated power play. So I think there's goals in this series, and we're going to start right away in game one taking over, five and a half, especially five and a half, not turning that down. In the NHL playoffs and the NBA playoffs, I want game two action so bad. I'm going to try as hard as I can not to have too much game one action you can situationally set yourself up very, very well. If you can be patient yeah. and focus on, you know, when you expect the team to bounce back in a series, when the pressure is off of a team and they don't need that next win. If the underdog steals game one on the road, you know, the home team is going to smash to the best of their abilities in game two, things of that nature. I'm going to watch Tampa, Florida game one. Don't want action in it. Two spectacular hockey teams. I will cheer Bobanos over five and a half. We move on. 3 p.m. Eastern on Sunday. We have the Washington Capitals, 40, 31, and 11, 18, 19, and four on the road at the New York Rangers, 55, 23, and four, 30, 11, and 0 home, Madison Square Garden in New York, New York. We just spoke about Vasilevsky not delivering up to his abilities, and the same thing can be said about Shesty. Uh, Shesterkin did look a little better again late in the year as the Rangers tightened everything up, but he hasn't looked as good and we talked about Kemper uh, expecting him to struggle this year expecting him to struggle last year I'm not high on him uh, but Charlie Lindgren has stepped up so 
We, and and having a guy like Kemper on the bench isn't the worst thing in the world. If something goes wrong, you can bring him out there. You know, if you get shellacked 7 0, he can start the next game. So, uh, and North End, you're talking about Paul, uh, Isamont, uh, Jano, Shiri. Yeah, I agree. I, I love I love Tampa's depth. I think Tampa, I don't need to take Tampa at the plus 165. You know, I've got futures on them, but th- this is going to be, they're going to be, a, if, if, if Florida can knock them out, I mean, that's the problem in the NHL playoffs is to knock out these tough hockey teams. You're beaten, battered, bruised, and then you got to face another series. It's very difficult. So here we go. The Capitals are plus 350 to win the series. Rangers minus 450. The Capitals are 150 to 1 to win the Cup, 75 to 1 to win the conference. Rangers 7 to 1 to win the Cup, plus 325 to win the conference. And the Capitals were much better than I expected them to be. And. Ovi stepping up in the second half was a thing of beauty. Uh, we're so lucky that we get to watch a goal scorer of his quality with the, that matches goal scoring with toughness, who loves hockey more than anything in the world. I mean, we're just lucky. Very, very fortunate uh, to watch a player like Ovi in his career. The Capitals closed the season very strong. They won four or five. They squeaked into the playoffs, finished with that 2-1 win to Philadelphia on Tuesday. Feel good about themselves. Rangers finished the season strong, winning 5-7 to seven on their way to the President's Trophy. Philip Heedle, I thought he was done for the year. So I it did surprise me. Maybe I just, or maybe it was always the regular season, but Philip Hedl looks to be available in the playoffs. Blake Wheeler is expected to be back if needed. I mean, he, he probably wouldn't break their top 12 right now, but if needed. So if those guys come back, we have a completely healthy New York Rangers squad. Let's get into the line history here for this one. This total is at five and a half minus 120 to the under. I open up minus 115 to the under. We have a five cent move to the under in game one. On the money line, we have, the Rangers sitting here at minus 226. They opened up at minus 226. There's been no movement. Uh, the Rangers have a lot of pressure on them to succeed. The Capitals have zero. That makes the Capitals a difficult hockey team. In saying that, I don't want to be involved. The Rangers can beat you high scoring. The Rangers can beat you low scoring and defensive. You ask how you want to play the hockey game, and the Rangers can beat you. But from a from a making money standpoint, I do not know if they're equipped to represent the Eastern Conference in the Stanley Cup final. I would be interested in fading them against a few teams, the Capitals not being one of them. I don't have interest in this. I don't have interest in the Rangers minus one. I don't have I just don't have interest in this game one or series or futures. Take it away for us, Bobano. Capitals Rangers. Yeah, this is one where I considered a series <clears throat> series handicap on the Rangers. But then I started talking to one of my great friends and viewers on the Ice Guys show, John Massey, who's a big-time Rangers fan. And he warned me, the Rangers never make it easy on themselves, or very rarely do they not make it uh, – very rarely do they make it uh, easy on themselves. And how many times have we seen the Rangers? Wow, they should steamroll this team in the first round. The next thing you know, we're going to game seven. You know, it's so I don't know if I'm rushing to lay the series handicap here with the uh, Rangers. I do think the Rangers are the better team. I do think there's an element to this with the Washington Capitals that they overachieved tenfold to even get to this point here in the Stanley Cup playoffs. They had to rely on a defensive shell type of game down the stretch. They had to rely on out of this world goaltending from a very unlikely candidate to deliver something like that in Charlie Lindgren. Uh, down the stretch for them. Can that sustain itself, especially against a Rangers team that when the power plays rolling, they can be lethal. Now, five-on-five play for the Rangers, I'll admit, in the last week or two, was not thrilled with it. You know, a lot of their damage was power play damage. Hell, there was a game against uh, Ottawa where I think every goal for them was on the power play in some form, or on a power play, because they also scored a short and a goal. But five on five, you know, their even strength play was not nearly as good down the stretch. That does concern me a bit, but I don't know if Washington's the team that's going to make them pay for that when it's all said and done. So this is a series where I think the Rangers win in six. Or, you know, it could be a, it could be four or five. Like if the Rangers play their A game and Washington becomes a pumpkin and kind of plays more like what we think their ro- like their roster to me is not as good as what we've seen in their ability to get to this point. But the one thing they've gotten is they've committed to team defense. And that's a credit to Spencer Carberry. He's one heck of a coach, and he's already proven that with this Washington team and getting outstanding goaltending from Lindgren. And if the defensive structure is there, the shutdown mentality is there, and the Rangers' uh, five-on-five play is uneven like it was down the stretch, 
Washington's going to have a pathway to be right there in this series and hang in there, but I'm not betting on that to happen. Just like I'm not betting the Rangers at this kind of a price. So this is a, this is a, this is a series where I can see a sweep. I, I think the Rangers win. The one thing that would surprise me is Washington winning in any form. Um, that would surprise me a little bit, but it wouldn't shock me because they've defied the odds all year. And, and the Rangers have rarely made it easy on themselves in some playoff series in years past. But I do think the Rangers advance and I could see anything. I could see four. I could see five. I could see six. I could see them needing to go the distance. So uh, interesting series, but not one I'm involved in pre-series. Yeah, I think Billy nailed it too. I think anytime the Capitals take a one-goal lead, it, as long as it's not in the first five to ten minutes of the first period, you, you know, I I try to wait till about six five minutes left in the first period. To, you, you need to be getting plus legitimate plus. Yeah, it's not you don't want the early goal by the Caps and then you get the Rangers minus one fifteen. No my there's no never a, there there's in my live bets in NHL there's never a minus beside it ever not one time ever, it's only plus, you know. So I I think Billy absolutely nailed it. Let's move on. Next up for us we head west for the first time in these NHL breakdowns. Colorado Avalanche 50, 25 and seven 19, 16 and six on the road at the Winnipeg Jets 52, 24 and six 27, 11, three at home Canada Life Center Winnipeg Manitoba. Get to see the whiteout created by the great Roger Nielsen. He's coaching the Vancouver Canucks. But the Jets have taken it, and a lot of the teams have. And the Jets do a nice job with the whiteout. Jets to win the cup, 11-1. to Avs to win the cup, 8-1. to The Avalanche to win the Western Conference, plus 425. Uh, Winnipeg, plus 600. And to win the series here for this one, the Jets are plus 115, the Avalanche minus 135. These are bet 365 odds. We've already heard from Mel, uh, you know, and, and I'd love to hear Steve G's thoughts about this. But Mel, so Mel, Steve G, you know, Colorado Avalanche fans living in, you know, in Colorado. And Mel's best bet is the Jets to win the series. It's been such a yo yo roller coaster ride, the Avalanche this year. At times, their backers are the most confident. You know, and I know how many people have cashed live on the Avalanche when they go down two or three goals. Uh, I don't go. I only, uh, and it's it's something that I'm very strict about. I don't go for the huge score. I I, I take the team when they're down one goal, uh, with you know five minutes left in the first or early in the second, and I don't touch it again. And there's times where I could have had a huge score. That's okay. I keep it very strict. I bet it once, and and it's just my system, and it works for me. It can work differently for others. And the Avalanche coming from behind and being absolutely spectacular. It was shocking to watch the Avalanche back their way into the playoffs. There's a lot of question marks with Georgiev. Even though he was an Iron Man this year, his numbers weren't very good. Is he capable? The Winnipeg Jets penalty killing has not been good this year. You're going up against the wrong hockey team in the Colorado Avalanche if your penalty killing is not up to snuff. They have the right personnel for the penalty killing to be strong. I don't quite understand. And we know what Hellebuck is capable of in the playoffs. We know what we just watched his second possible Vesna trophy this year. Remember he won, I believe it was in 2019 and he showed out once again, clearly signing Shifley uh, and Hellebuck before the season started to those matching contracts. And that's when I moved on them on the uh, not over 91 and a half points. We talked about it in our chat. It was just like they, they, they set, a, a message. They send a message to everyone. And that's why it was so shocking that nobody was showing up at Canada Life Center and they will for the series. This is as exciting as hockey will ever get. You go up against the Colorado Avalanche in the playoffs. So the Avalanche coming up their second win in six games, 5-1 at home versus the Oilers on Thursday. They're hoping to have Samuel Gerrard back. And maybe Steve G can tell us if, if I, we expect them to come back. The big story around the NHL with the Avalanche over the last little while, and Steve, I'd love to hear you touch on this as well, is Casey Middlestad. Has at first they were like, This is the best trade. Look how good, look how deep. And then all of a sudden, hey, where's Casey Middlestad? Where is he? Where's he been the last 10 days, two weeks? I'm missing in action. He's a young player. Uh, this there's a lot of pressure. Buffalo knows all about that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd love I'd love, so Steve G says I like our chances with home ice, but not looking good without it. Winnipeg is the best goals against and goalie performance. Gonna be a great series. No bets. Daniel says, Is this year, Winnipeg's year? Finally, been saying this for 15 years. 
North Andrews says the Jets also have a very strong home ice advantage. A Philly Eagle Flyers on the Avs advancing. Deacon Mike says Colorado had 20 games scoring five goals or more led the NHL. Things are a little different here. And Real Deal Prime saying Middlestad left last game with an injury. He's not on the uh, injury report right now. So nobody closed the season as hot as the Jets. Uh, they had that hiccup, uh, sort of like the Panthers around the same time, but they got right a little bit before the Panthers. They win eight straight games. This is a healthy group. This is a very, very, very dangerous, healthy group. I've watched uh, these players that they have on the Jets succeed in playoff situations. Now we've watched the Avalanche win the Stanley Cup. Right now, Winnipeg in game one is minus 107. This line opened up this morning at 8.05 at Pinnacle. So there's been no movement. Uh, and then from a total scenario here, we have the five and over five and a half and minus 115. To watch Shifley, who has so much character, rest in peace, Dale Howarchuk. And Dale, you were absolutely right. Pushing Winnipeg to draft Shifley seventh overall. We all love you, Dale Howarchuk and the Howarchuk family. This watching Shifley try to contain McKinnon, and he won't have to do it alone. Adam Lowry is the perfect defensive forward for playoff type situation. This Jets team has a lot of character, but can you beat the Avalanche in a seven game series? Take it away, Bobano. Avalanche Jets. I, I had to look this up because I like the over here in game one. I'm making that official um, in the in this uh, for, first game on Sunday in Winnipeg. Over five and a half, minus 115 at Pinnacle. I mean, to me, this is this is very cheap uh, with what I see as far as this total goes. Um, Winnipeg and Colorado, you look at, I believe, this year, a 6-2. We saw, obviously, the 7 nothing drubbing at the hands of uh, win, uh, uh, win, uh, the hands of uh, Winnipeg for Colorado last weekend, April. I couldn't believe how bad they were in that game. It was unbelievable to watch and witness just how pathetic the Avs were. It's one of the worst games you'll ever see them play. But I'm looking at the uh, series history this year with uh, Colorado uh, and Winnipeg. I'm seeing 4-2, 6-2, uh, and 7 nothing in the three head-to-head -head meetings. Um, five and a half is just too low. And I'll tell you why it's too low, because we know Colorado can score. But the the narrative is Winnipeg doesn't have enough offense, right? And Winnipeg, sometimes they they struggle to find offense. They struggle to put the puck in the back of the net. Well, I'll tell you who's fixed that for Winnipeg. Gabe Velarde has fixed that. You look at Winnipeg when they were struggling offensively and they had that little downturn uh, and they were having a hard time putting the puck in the net. They were without Gabe Velarde in many of those games, almost all of them. You know, the loss to Toronto, the shutout to Pittsburgh, losing 4-1 to Philly. Um, you know, Gabe Velarde was uh, banged up at that time. You look now with Gabe Velarde back since February 17th. You look at when he's been in the lineup here for this uh, Jets team. They've suddenly been a, a team trending over. You know, they had three straight overs when he came back, four and one to the over when he first came back. And since February the uh, 17th uh, for uh, Gabe Velarde. Now we're talking about games with him in the lineup. You know, we're excluding that period from the end of February to near the end of March when he missed a month. We're talking about games with Gabe Velarde in the lineup for this Winnipeg Jets team. And we're talking about a team that, from an over perspective, excluding pushes, has gone 11 and 3 to the over in 14 games with Gabe Velarde in the lineup since February 17th. 11 and 3 to the over. And that is because he is a difference maker. He was an incredible get by Kevin Chevelday off last year in that deal for Pierre Luc Dubois, which looks like highway robbery at this point. Uh, he's been incredible. He's been like, look at the goal he scored last night. If he shoot that shoots that puck right away, Demko makes the save, but he had the poise and the patience to wait, wait, wait for the goalie to commit. And then he just casually and calmly put deposited it in the back of the net. He's just a gifted play, great hands, uh, an underrated release. And he has given this jets team a, a different dimension offensively. Now you've got Kyle Connor red hot coming into this series. What if Shifley gets going? You've got Sean Monahan, who hopefully for the first time in his career can drag his regular season performance into the playoffs, which has been a problem for him going back to Calgary. But if there's ever a time for him to do it, he can do it here. So they've got more offensive weapons and uh, depth, I think, than people think. Uh, they've got Morrissey, a dynamic playmaker on the back end. Now, Colorado's got more of it than Winnipeg. There's no doubt. But the concern for me with Colorado is – you can say all you want, Colorado biding time, waiting for the playoffs to get here. Maybe that explains the malaise down the stretch. But this has been an extended run of poor defense, breakdowns in the defensive zone, turnovers with the puck, 
and borderline horrific goaltending from Alexander Georgiev. This has been weeks of this now from Colorado. What, we're just going to play game one and flip a switch and the defense will be fine again? Goaltending will be fine? Georgiev's going to be a brick wall now all of a sudden? I don't buy it. So I think this series is going to have more goals than people think, and I really like this over in game one. I love it. You are locked in over five and a half at minus 115. You want to talk about perfect gambling situations? Uh, Jets win both games at home. It's 2-0 going back to Colorado. Betting Colorado in game three down 2-0. I mean, that, that's just... Even I would for as much questions as I have with Colorado. Oh, that, that would, would just... be a spot where, you know, they know they don't want to go... They can't go down 3 nothing. Oh, man. Minus one, at team home. total over. You know what I've done with Colorado? Last night I did it. I did it with the Vegas game last Sunday when they got embarrassed by Winnipeg and they had to play Vegas in Vegas on Sunday afternoon. I took a team total over one first period and team total over one and a half first period the team total over one and a half first period against vegas was like plus 260 for colorado and they had two goals in the first period same thing last night you would have cashed it easily those two bets hell you could have cashed three and a half team total in that first period last night yeah it was, a, it was my only bet on the card last night it was the avalanche minus one which you know and then you got the gift of all gifts with seven top players sitting out for edmonton later in the day yeah <laughs> We, we, we talked about that. I mean, uh, you figured the, it. Some someone was going to sit out at least, but you didn't well, expect. We knew that, that, and I didn't expect that many guys to be out last night. And yet, yeah. Skinner's starting. What a stupid move! I know they only played him for a period, but that was dumb. Shouldn't have even played at all. That was Skinner. dumb. That yeah. was dumb. Let's roll on. We got to speed it up a little. Now, remember, no. the first ML game is two twenty. Sorry, no. MLB game is two twenty. So we don't need to panic. Next yeah. up for us, at ten p.m. Eastern. On Sunday night, Nashville Predators 47, 30, and 5, 24, 14, and 3 on the road. The Vancouver Canucks 50, 23, and 9, 27, 9, and 5 at home at Rogers Arena in Vancouver, BC. Nashville is plus 140 to win the series. I think that's a fair price. And I'm going to bet it. I want it in my pocket. Uh, I, I haven't figured out exactly how much to bet on it here. Maybe it'll just be that, that regular unit for 300, but I do want Nashville plus 140 in my pocket. Nashville to win the Cup 28 to 1, to win the Conference 15 to 1. Vancouver to win the Cup 11 to 1, to win the Conference 6 to 1. You know, it's a, it's a really difficult situation for Demko here. We've all watched them completely take over a series. You know, the Blues win the Stanley Cup, they face the Canucks in the bubble. The Canucks were not a good hockey team. Demko was spectacular, won the series. Knocked out the defending Stanley Cup champions. Here, we haven't seen much of him. This is a very difficult ask. I'm not saying he's not capable of it, but it's a very dis difficult ask. Then you have UC Saros. Uh, and there's Maggie right there, the Iron Lady, Thatcher Demko. Then we have UC Saros, the only goal starting goaltender that's 5'11 in the NHL, the smallest goal starting goaltender in the NHL. And he's not had a great season. Uh, he's been, you know, shellacked at times. I still believe in him. He could step up here. Uh, the Predators finished the season uh, losing 4-2 at Pittsburgh. Snapped their two-game winning streak. We watched them get a point in 18 straight games. This team is built for the playoffs. Luke Shen and Ryan McDonough. I mean, they're, that, is that not your dream bottom pair defenseman? Like, if you were putting together your perfect playoff team, wouldn't maybe you don't want them playing together because they don't have enough speed. Maybe you want one on one line, another on another, but... Come on, heart, soul, character. I want Luke Shen over McDonough. I want Luke Shen so badly in the playoffs. His, his toughness. They have team toughness. They have team speed. You see Forsberg's numbers this year? He was absolutely, what did he go, 94 points? Yeah, incredible. He, he was absolutely spectacular. And, and, and he took players with him. Yeah. Uh, players that we don't, look at Nyquist's year this year. You know, remember Mr. when. Virgin's I, playing I, with Phil. Exactly, yep. There was times we thought Nyquist and Tatar were done. Now, Tatar is done. Yeah. Nyquist, almost a point a game this year. O'Reilly doing the dirty things, the little things to make this team go. Yeah. You've got great young talent in Evangelista. This is a – and then, of course, we haven't even mentioned Roman Yossi. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so the Canucks did just enough down the stretch to hold on to the Pacific Division title. Uh, they lose 4-2 at the Jets. You know, JT Miller wasn't out there. He won the MVP for the team this year. He was by far the MVP. Uh, toddler shoulders, Pedersen's been nowhere to be found for weeks. Now, he could score a huge goal. Let's say let's say Pedersen's nowhere to be found all game, and he scores an overtime goal to win them game one. And then he could heat right up. I mean, that's what happens with snipers. You know, this is a healthy group. Zadarov brought size, but their forward group isn't tough enough. 
Uh, you hear Kessler talking about, you know, who are who are the character guys on the Vancouver Canucks? Now, I don't like Kessler as a man, as a guy, uh, but but he was a tough playoff type performer. They ask him, who are the guys with character? Who are the guys with toughness? First, immediately JT Miller. Of course, JT Miller is your ever. He's phenomenal. And then Connor Garland. Oh no, that that's those are the character. That's the team toughness to. And now we have Dakota Joshua. There's players who can step up and be big, but all the pressure in the world is on Vancouver. The house of losers uh, never won a Stanley Cup. Now, I know the Sabres have never won a Stanley Cup, but all the Canucks know is to buckle under pressure. And this is a very, very, very difficult matchup. And I do not believe in the Canucks. I would love to see them make it through the first round. I do not believe in this hockey team. The over 5.5 minus 119 uh, opened at minus 119, now minus 116, a very small move to the under. And then on the money line for game one, the Predators are plus 128. I don't think I need uh, to bet that, really. You know, uh, I'm interested in it. I don't need to be in game one. The pressure is so high. I, I don't know how exactly to bet this yet. I got to figure this out. Uh, I've got till Sunday night. I want Nashville. I want Nashville to win the series. Uh, Sky Dragon says, honestly, he thinks this price is cheap. You know. Uh, and I'm sure you've watched a lot of their hockey. I, I, I've watched a lot of Canucks hockey, and I'm about to watch them lose. Maybe they can get through the first round. I hope they can get through the first round for the sake of the city. Take it away, Bobano. Nashville Predators, Vancouver Canucks. I thought I was going to be on Nashville here, but I might pump the brakes. Um, I might pump the brakes uh, because I think Vancouver did a decent job down the stretch steadying the ship a little bit. Uh, you know, getting back to, you know, pretty solid defensive play. Thatcher Demko looked good, you know, in the, in the games that he returned for. Uh, and I think when you look at it, if you're Vancouver, you've got a coach in Rick Tockett, you know, that to me has done a really nice job with this group. He's pushed the right buttons a lot of the time. Uh, and, uh, you know, I thought for, I definitely don't want to bet against Nashville at this price, but I thought I was going to be on Nashville and um, I, I, I don't know if I love the price enough to take it. I lean Nashville because I do think there's a dangerous opponent for Vancouver with Philip Forsberg playing at the high level. But here's what concerns me about Nashville. It's kind of the same thing I talked about earlier about the Islanders. If Forsberg somehow, and easier said than done, right, to shut him down. But let's say he is shut down. And that line is subdued by Vancouver. Where are they going to turn? Can Evangelista step up? Are you going to get something from Key for Sherwood? Who beyond that, Tommy Novak, and he, you know, bring his regular season performance into this series? That's going to be the big question. There are still concerns about that third and that fourth line from an offensive punch perspective for the uh, Nashville Prairie. You're going to get Mark Jankowski going on that, and I love him because he's from my area here, just outside of Hamilton. But you know, is he going to be able to chip in like he did during the regular season? That's going to be end up being the question. And we do have a situation too with Soros, very much like with Vasilevsky, where you know, he's had these incredible seasons in the past. This was not one of his better seasons. He was, he was, it was all right. It was solid, but he wasn't great. And, and, and you see the numbers, it stands out that way. I think you kind of have to give, assuming Demko's healthy, which he looks like it, and the fact he played well in those last two games, I think you got to give certainly him a little bit of an edge in net. This should be a very close series. I think there's going to be a lot of close games, a, lot, a competitive series uh, when it's all said and done. So, like I said, I think Nashville makes this a good series. But at the same point in time, I was not comfortable with taking them only at this price. And I like that Vancouver kind of got back to look the way they're going to have to win, you know, is they're going to have to be get a scoring by committee uh, and they are going to have to make sure they rely on everyone uh, in the lineup. So uh, I look at, you know, not just because you can't rely on Pedersen fully with what we saw down the stretch. Miller's going to have to be good, which he's capable of. Besser's going to have to be good, which he's capable of. And I think, too, and this goes to actually an official bet that I do have uh, on this uh, series, uh, I think it's well worth a look. Um, and we saw him find the back of the net last night. This is, to me, another guy that is the, the value is just too good to resist. Leading goal scorer in the series. Now, Philip Forsberg could easily win it, and he's the rightful favorite, you know, to be the leading goal scorer in this series at plus 275, JT Miller plus 550, Besser plus 650, Pedersen 750, O'Reilly 850. But right after that is the guy I'm targeting for the Vancouver Canucks, Connor Garland, plus 1,200. Uh, I'm locking that in for leading goal scorer in the series. He's got smallest guy on the ice, but maybe the biggest ticker is 
Bill Raftery would say, love his effort, love his compete level. He's willing to go to the areas of the ice you need to, even for a smaller guy to score goals. Red hot down the stretch. It's got all the makings of a very live 1,200, plus 1,200, 12 to 1 ticket. Garland to lead the goal, lead the series in goals. And other than that, that's it for me here. Yeah, I there's going to be a lot of opportunities now. You, you can't take the Predators plus one and a half on the handicap. It's minus 175. Yeah. Too expensive. Yeah. So, uh, I, you know, I, I can't wait to. And I remember, can't... with so many of these series, you notice I haven't moved on a series price yet in anything we've talked about because mm-hmm. there's going to be opportunities opening up based on what happens in game one. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You're yeah. absolutely right. Uh, NJ Stryker, we'll, we'll close with that question. NJ Stryker saying uh, Stanley Cup Finals. All right, we have two series left, and then we get into NBA. So let's move on to the next one. And my, my God, is there a more fascinating situation in all sports? I, I don't think so. West first round, Monday, April 22nd, Las Vegas Golden Knights, or Vegas Golden Knights, excuse me, 45-29-8, 18-17-6 and on the road at Dallas Stars, 52-21-9, and 26-11-4 at home, American Airlines Center in Dallas, Texas. When in your lifetime have you seen the number one seed in the conference against the lowest seed in the conference and it be minus 130 plus 110. And it's just wild. Absolutely wild. You have the lowest seed in the Western Conference that's just 10 to 1 to win it all and plus 525 to win the conference. Now they are the defending Stanley Cup champions and they did circumvent the cap and and that allowed them to bring in Thomas Hurdle, you know, amongst other players at the deadline. Dallas to win the cup, 8 to 1 conference plus 425. You know, Jamie Ben has stepped up and showed more character than he showed early in his career. Remember, he's a first round talent that went fifth round uh, because of up here. Uh, but he has shown his toughness, his grit. I mean, you know, he, he's he's been good. The DeBoer has not overplayed players. They've rolled four lines. Rupee hints. I mean, you know, is Robertson. We thought Robertson might be a perennial 100 point score. What do you go this year for 80? Rupee hints had what, 65? Still, little Joe with Rupee. And Robertson is a f- dangerous, dangerous line. And then you have Wyatt Johnston, the ro- the kid, like, you know, picking everybody up. This team has a ton of depth. And Ottinger hasn't been very good. Is he capable of stepping up? We've seen him do it before. And then for Vegas, it doesn't matter who they put in net. They sprinkle magic fairy dust on them and they become George Vesna. So... I mean, yeah, I expect Aiden Hill to, to, to roll here. And if he doesn't, I expect Logan Thompson to be Johnny Bauer. You know, I, I I don't know how they do it, and but they continue to do it. Vegas comes in off a surprise 4-1 loss at home last night to the Ducks, gave them the lowest seed of all. Uh, Stone will be back. They're hoping to have William Carrier as well, which would make him completely healthy. For Dallas, they've been waiting for Yanni Hockenpah to be good to go, and then they'll be complete. They finished their season winning their 12th in 14 games. I mean, how good have they been playing down the stretch, and yet they're just completely – you could say they're being disrespected in the in, in the market. You could say it. In game one here – sorry, let me move over to Monday. In game one, we have the Vegas Golden Knights at plus 118 at Pinnacle. They open up at plus 109, so there's been 10 cents of movement towards Dallas. There should be. You know – you know, Dallas in game one is 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 becoming, the more I think about it, is becoming more appealing. And it's not just this 10 cent move towards them. Uh, this total, by the way, uh, five and a half minus 108 to the over. This is, Vegas will get better and better and better throughout the playoffs. Why would they be so good game one? Well, man, I, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't get here until I started t- saying this out loud, but why would they be ready to go in game one? And if anybody wants, Vegas for the series, you were going to take plus 110 against the best team in the Western Conference. You almost want them to lose game one, and then you come in on Vegas. Yep. So I'm going to be on the Stars in game one on the minus one line. I, I don't know how these teams are so... It's not the teams, it's the players. Kucherov sits all season and comes in and, and he wins the con Smythe. You know, uh, I think he won the consmite that year. I, I just remember him, you know, shirtless drinking a beer. But I, I believe that he won the consmite. Uh, you know, Stone's going to do it. Stone's already done it before. Uh, sat for months and then come in and rolled. How could they be ready in game one? How could they be ready? I, you know what? I'm going to bet against them being ready in game one. I'm not taking the Stars to win the series. I don't want the Knights to win the series. I want these two teams to beat the shit out of each other. I'm going to move on the Stars. Minus one in game one. Take it away, Bobano. Vegas, Dallas. 
I am right there with you uh, with Dallas in game one. This is definitely – actually, I forgot to mention, too, with the over – I, I am on Winnipeg in game one as well uh, against Colorado oh. and the series. I forgot to mention that. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, Winnipeg okay. and game one and the series against uh, Colorado. Okay, give me uh, those prices. Actually, when I sorry, sorry. Them. I screwed that up. Sorry, I screwed okay. that up. Winnipeg in the series. Not game Just one. Not okay. game one. I actually okay. stayed. I, I had it circled game one, but then I thought, you know what? Last time Colorado played this team, they got embarrassed seven nothing. That kind of made me uneasy about game one, but I think in the series, I still like Winnipeg there. So yeah, Winnipeg in the series there uh, against uh, Colorado. That's the one series bet I've made. This is the second. I'm on Dallas game one with you uh, in this uh, the, the individual game one. Uh, with uh, Dallas, actually, let me first get you the uh, series price with the. Uh, you can uh, find me that once we break down when I'm breaking down the next game. Let's plus one fifteen. Okay. Plus one fifteen for the Jets for the series. Uh, for this one, Dallas game one. I'm with you. Um, I think when you look at this, this adds up for Dallas. Vegas didn't play great down the stretch. Mark Stone is will play. I, I you know I'll, I'll say that right now. He is going to play. He's going to be back. Of course he is. Because you just know that's the machinations of what they've been doing the last couple of years. They're going to find a way to get him back and in there. He'll probably play in game one. But sometimes that screws up chemistry. You can't expect him to be you know, at his best uh, right away, even if he does play that night. But more importantly, this is about intangibles. It's about a Dallas team that if they don't take care of business in game one, they're in some trouble. This is their spot. This is their game. You've been the better team in the regular season. You were the better team down the stretch. You have home ice. You got totally and utterly crushed by Vegas in the elimination game last year in the Western Conference Final. And you're building six to nothing last year. You'd better be ready to go here for game one. And I expect them to. And if not, shame on them. Shame on me, but shame on them uh, for, for not being ready here in this game. Revenge for last year. And it's, revenge matters not throughout the whole series. But I think in game one, it definitely matters. And I know I, I heard you say that Vegas has all these warriors and all these champion, you know, and they do. Petrangelo and uh, and obviously what they've got up front. Marcia so guys that have elevated their game in the playoffs. Eichel had a good play. Uh, you know, they've got the players that can do it. And they got the blue line that can do it. But there's still questions. I'm not as convinced as you that Aiden Hill's just clicking his fingers and he's back to the form last year. He didn't have a good year. He didn't have a good down the stretch for the uh, Vegas Golden Knights. And I know people are ragging on Ottinger a little bit. He hasn't always lived up. That was not a great series for him in the West Final last year. But he's capable. I I love that he struggled early in the year, Jimmy. Faced adversity, Jake Ottinger. You know what he did down the stretch? He fl turned it up another level, another notch, and he played his best hockey down the stretch. Jake Ottinger. That is what I like from him. He got better. His numbers improved. His best play was in uh, April and, and late March. That's good news for Dallas. And I know you said who's got the heart for Dallas because you're right. There's some question marks about a Tyler Sagan in the playoffs. There's question marks about Jamie Benn, even the captain, uh, in the playoffs. But I'll say this about Jamie Benn. He's been on fire since the early part of March. He's been piling up the points. And I truly believe this guy has new life, new adrenaline, new energy playing alongside these two young kids, these two young studs on that third line right now, Wyatt Johnston and Logan Stankoven, who have been absolutely outstanding. I truly believe it's given this guy a, a, a new life. He's playing like a 10-year a, a, a younger Jamie Benn down the stretch. You just hope and pray that he brings it like this, game in, game out in the Stanley Cup playoffs, because that's been his problem at times. No shows and invisibility you know, in the big moments at times from Jamie Benn. But if you're going to go by what we've seen from him uh, down the stretch, I think he's ready to 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 turn to change the narrative and, and to show that he can uh, get the job done. So, and I love, I think they're, I think they can match the Vegas forward group. In fact, you could say now Dallas is deeper up front, even the fourth line. I've seen Radic Boxa score big goals. I've seen Sam Steele, who's a very good fourth line player for Dallas chip in offensively, and then forget it with the first three lines. They're outstanding. Everybody, Robertson, Hintz, uh, Pavelski, Mr. Playoffs, Marchman, Sagan. Um, it's incredible to watch how much depth. And then that great Ben Stankoven, Wyatt Johnston line. I mean, they are loaded up front. Their blue line is better now. Haskinen's got support because it's not just him. Chris Tanev brought in to shore up the blue line, to put his face, his body, 
his back, his neck, and every piece of his body in front of every puck known to man blocking shots, which is going to go a long way. I don't think there was enough blocking shots commitment last year from Dallas outside of Haskinen. Now you got Tanev to help that out. You've got Ottinger in good form. So I like Dallas to take game one. This is a, they, they got to come out storming here against a team that knocked them out unceremoniously in the West Final last year that limping their way a little bit into the playoffs. So Dallas in game one. And I'm also going to jump on Dallas, not for the series. Actually, you know what? I'm changing Dallas. Yeah, why would I take Dallas in game one if I like them in the series? I'm going to go instead of Dallas minus one in, in game one, Jimmy. I'm going to take, because I like them in the series too, at FanDuel. I'm taking Dallas to win game one and the series, plus 146. That makes sense to me, because I don't know if Dallas wins this series if they lose game one. It's just such a downer. It's just such a, uh-oh, here's Vegas again, about to go on this run. Uh-oh, here we go again against a team that knocked us out last year. It's just such a mental block, potentially, for Dallas if they lose this game, that they're in a hurdle they're going to have to overcome, that to the point where if they lose game one, I'd be worried about them in the series. So that is why I'm going to approach it this way. Dallas to win game one and the series plus 146 at FanDuel. You got it. And if if Dallas loses game one, what a gift it will be betting them on the minus one line in game two. It will be absolute. You, you, you know, you'll be able to get everything back and more uh, on that. And I'm going to be on stars minus one in game one. And, we just did a whole breakdown about Vegas without mentioning. You know what? Chandler. Actually, I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna double up with. The, I'm gonna I'm gonna take game one individually as well. I am okay. because I, I I'd be stunned if they lose game one. It's just it's cir- it's triple circled. They're playing great. Vegas is gonna need a game, I think, especially if Stone and some of these parts come back to get uh, the chemistry right, get in sync. Yeah, so I'm gonna also take individually Dallas game one minus one twenty five. Oh, just on the money line. Money line, yep. yep. Okay, you got it. Uh, you got it. And I was going to say, we just mentioned, we just talked about the Vegas Golden Knights. I didn't mention Chandler Stevenson and Nicholas Waugh. Yep. They're, oh, yeah. per, they're, they're your, if you were to go, in, if you were playing a video game and you were building a playoff, you know, a, a second line and a third. I think Nicholas Waugh, can be third line center. He can be fourth line center. They're, they're putting Willie Carlson as the third line center right now, a Wild Bill, uh, and using Waugh at the fourth line. I mean, that, but he can do so many things. Um, I love it. Okay, let's move on to our final game here, final matchup of round one NHL playoff action. It is the Los Angeles Kings 44-27-11, 22-15-4 on the road at the Edmonton Oilers 49-27-6, 28-9-4-home Rogers Place in Edmonton, Alberta. You have to think this is the weakest goaltending of any series, and of course that um, explodes the volatility. Uh, Skinner, 905 save percentage this year, 36-16-5 and five with two shutouts. 2.62 goals against average. Uh, Pickard's actually had better numbers, but it's much smaller sample size. It's tough, you know, starting 60 games in the NHL. Very tough. 12 7 and 1, 2.45 goals against average, 9 save percentage for Pickard. If, if you see Pickard out there, you know that the Kings are going to upset the Oilers. You don't want to ever, you don't want to see Pickard out there, but he could be there. Uh, Talbot, if Talbot could come back and snake. Edmonton, the team he used to play for. I mean, that would be uh, the greatest thing that happened to him. And Riddick, Riddick wasn't bad this year. He could, he could back up. I, I, you know, again, if you see the backups in net, your team is in trouble. Kings barely got past the Blackhawks last night, five four in overtime to set up a series with the Oilers. They've been barely getting past teams ever since that huge run they had on the road, that glorious record breaking run they have on the road in the first twenty five games of the year, and then it just all falls apart. You know, it all falls apart. Oh, let's do a quick switch here and get you. There you go. It all, it all fell apart. And I don't know what to make of them, but the Oilers backed their way into the playoffs losing four or five. You know, they closed things out with that 5-1 loss of Colorado. They rested everybody. Uh, both teams are healthy right now. The Kings are plus 180 to win the series. The Oilers are minus 220. The Kings to win the Cup 25-1, to Conference 14-1. to Edmonton Cup 7-1 to and Conference plus 375. At this point here... This is by far the best Oilers team in the Connor McDavid era. You don't need to be a great regular season team. You need to have the physical makeup to be a great postseason team and a big team and a tough team to play against. And they, you know, they robbed the Predators of Matthias Ekholm, uh, and now they have a warrior that can play and, and take the pressure off of Darnell Nurse, who, who can be disappointing at times. You have Zach Hyman, uh, who got kid who's never been the best player on his team in his whole entire life. 
and now he's you know a 50 goal scorer and, and so much character they, this team is more character now you know you could say that Corey Perry and Evander Kane you could there's a lot of different things you could say about those two gentlemen but they thrive in tough situations they don't thrive in a speed skating contest they thrive in a in in the toughest spots on the ice in the toughest games with the most emotion with now now Kane, both of them will give horrible penalties that'll just that you can lose a game over i mean there's a lot of pieces to this Oilers squad that are special and so we'll get to the question that nj striker posed here uh, the pressure is immense on the oilers immense and there's no pressure on the kings could the kings walk into edmonton and, and steal game one for us gamblers, that would be great because then you could move on the Oilers for the series and the Oilers in game two. I don't want the Oilers in game one. I don't want the Oilers series price right now. Uh, I want to watch game one. I, I don't find very much appealing here from a gambling standpoint because the Oilers are going to be carrying the weight of their the world on their shoulders. Take it away, Bobano. Our final NHL breakdown of round one matchups, Kings-Oilers. Yeah, you basically said it. I mean, it's it's true. I think Edmonton wins this series. I can't trust LA too much, too much uneven play. You know, some games they'll score four or five, and then they'll have that game where Talbot or Riddick, the one of the goalies, shits the bed and they'll lose. And then they'll have a game where they play their usual pretty staunch defense and they, they don't score. Their offense dries up. I mean, there's just that's been the LA Kings a lot the last few years, including this year. You know, so and that, that's the, been the problem with them against Edmonton the last couple of years in these playoff series. Their defense has not been good enough to shut down Edmonton. For as good as a defensive team as the Kings have been all these years, their defense hasn't been good enough to shut down Edmonton. And I don't know if it's going to be good enough to shut down Edmonton here again because, you know, years past you've still had quick, you know, playing at a decent level. You've, you've had goaltending you can really hang your hat on. Can you hang your hat on Cam Talbot, no. you know, as a playoff goaltender? I'm not so sure. Certainly can't hang your hat on David Riddick, you know, if he were to get in there as far as a playoff goaltender is concerned. So, you know, to me, what changes here? What changes for the LA Kings compared to the last two years where Edmonton knocked them out uh, in the uh, first round? And they go from Todd McClellan, who knew the Oilers inside and out, to Jim Hiller now, you know. So I, I got to see it before I believe it, you know, if the, that the uh, that the LA Kings that uh, third time's the charm that they're finally going to knock off the Edmonton Oilers here uh, in this series. I will say this to Jimmy's point about the uh, waiting on Edmonton here for game one. The last two years, um, Edmonton did win game one, but man, they were close games. I think they were both identical 4-3 uh, final scores. And I'm looking at the series a couple of years ago uh, with the uh, Kings and the Oilers, uh, which ended up, of course, going seven. It went the distance. Uh, game one went over. Uh, you look at uh, game uh, two, uh, game one last year, it was 4-3 in overtime. Uh, it also went over the total. And in fact, in that series, which was six games last year, it was a 4-2 and two over series. Game one went over, game two and three stayed under, and then 4-5 and six all went over the total. So there's been more goals than you would think here uh, with the uh, Kings uh, and the Oilers in this series. This total right now is six. It's shaded to the under. I'm not on a side here. I'm with you as far as what how I'm going to approach this, that I'm going to wait to see if maybe Edmonton gets a better adjusted series price later on, say if they lose game one or if they fall behind in this series at any point, then I would probably move on Edmonton for the series. But I've got nothing in this game from a side perspective, nothing in this. Actually, you know what? I do have – I know you've been waiting for a draw, right? You've been waiting for a draw. Um <laughs> Last year, overtime, 4-3 Edmonton in game one in this building. And I think L.A., two years in a row losing to this team, they, they throw a big punch. I don't know if it's enough to win the game, but I think it is enough to really test this Edmonton team, make it a difficult game one for them to win. Again, there's a Kings team that took the Oilers to overtime in game one last year. And then in game one the year before, it did not go to overtime. It was a regulation game, but it was a 4-3 game. Again, that close to overtime. So I do like the draw uh, here. My favorite draw of the game ones is right here. Kings Oilers draw plus 370 uh, at FanDuel. And I'm also going to grab because at Pinnacle, I see over five and a half minus 115. I'm taking that. 
I, I think when you look at it, 4-3, game one, each of the last two playoff seasons in game one with these two teams, bank on the history, bank on the fact that I don't trust the Kings' defense or their goaltending this year with the Talbot-Riddick combo to hold up. I love it. I love it. Billy Friedrich just entered the NHL playoff pool here at Pub Sports Radio. Thank you. You have till 5 p.m. on 5 p.m. on Saturday, April 20th, 420, uh, to get your picks in. There was a question about how many a future or sorry, how many series do I think will get to seven games? Uh, Truth Teller asked me the same question. Uh, he showed me the numbers. The, the highest vote was that two. And I was surprised at that. Uh, I, I would say three. And and even that four or more was appealing. There's so much parity in the NHL. I and 46% said two. I, I think three is probably the most likely and would lean towards four or more. Quickly, before we close this off, NJ Stryker said, if I gave you a free bet on a Stanley Cup winner right now, who would it be? And for me, and you know, I, I can't help it. Uh it'd be the Edmonton Oilers. Bobano, for you, who would it be? In the vocal stylings of, and I look probably two months ago, I would have said Florida. And I still, I, to me, I'm going to go Florida, Dallas, Stanley Cup final. And as Stanley Cup champions, Dallas, stars, Dallas, stars, Dallas, stars, Stanley Cup champions. Imagine Sagan handing the Stanley Cup to Duchesne. It's never going to happen. It's just never going to happen. Matt Duchesne getting the Stanley Cup from Tyler Sagan. Over my dead body. Okay. That is our NHL breakdown here. Uh, apologize that it went long. 